Hi, welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilder Beasts, we are going to explore how a severed octopus arm can still try to feed the octopus body, how Russia nearly went to war over fish farts, and why we use a rodent as a meteorologist. All right, let's go. Hey, hey, it's Groundhog Day, or we're getting there. And while it is a silly holiday where we look to a rodent to tell us the future and the weather, what could possibly go wrong? I thought it might be a good time to look at why we do this and go off on a groundhog tangent. Yes, we will get to learn how fish farts nearly started a war between Russia and Sweden, and we will absolutely get to that bit about the octopus still trying to eat with severed arms, and those arms, well, separated from their body, will try to feed the octopus. Septopus? Eh, but I have a wee bit of house cleaning and some welcomes to dish out first. I promise this won't take long. First, on February 2nd, 2021, I'm going to be giving a free presentation on what to do if you want to grow up to be a dog trainer, or if you are a grown-up, how to make the move into working with animals. But we will also be talking about the things they don't tell you when you love animals so much that you want to work with them, like how often you get peed on, having interesting conversations about pets, maturing in puppy classes in front of children, explaining that a dog's most favorite chew toy is actually probably a dried bull penis, all of it. All of the uncomfortable things that you might not think about when you decide to become a dog trainer or work with animals. It will be available for free after the presentation if you can't attend live, or if you have people in your life anywhere in the country who would like to hear how to get started in this industry. A lot has changed since I got into this profession 15 years ago, and there are just so many responsible avenues to take to be a responsible and educated dog trainer today. And it's so lovely. You can check out the New England Dog Training Club's website, nedtc.org. It rolls right off the tongue. Or you can search for New England Dog Training Club on YouTube. We will have it up as soon as possible after the talk. I was also on Ines McNeil's podcast, The Modern Dog Trainer, where we had talked about everything from helping people navigate city life with their dogs, which is my actual real job outside of this podcast. I am a professional dog trainer. It was a lovely conversation, and if you are interested at all about that world, absolutely check out The Modern Dog Trainer podcast. And if you came here from that responsible, reputable show, welcome. So without further ado... Let's get on to the fish farts. So let's go back 30 years ago. The ship, U-137. It was a Russian submarine that got stuck on the rocks in Sweden's harbor. As this was a whiskey-class ship, the Swedes used to call this event Whiskey on the Rocks, and it set off 15 years of very tense diplomatic communication between Russia and Sweden. Bombs nearly flew and military was on high alert for 15 years. A year after Whiskey on the Rocks, when the sub got stuck in Swedish waters, the Swedes started using their own submarines and helicopters and their own boats to try to find other submarines within their border. They were so convinced that the Russians were spying on them or might even use nuclear arms against the Swedish people. Fishermen and people had reported bubbles, periscopes, movement on the seafloor, and they even recorded sounds that indicated an invasion and all signs pointed to Russia spying on the Swedes, possibly in preparation for a nuclear attack. This is very scary stuff. The Swedish military kept collecting information, and their best evidence were the sounds that absolutely, without question, were used as proof that someone was spying on them. And if you heard this sound, it was absolutely a spy ship. Things got so bad that the leader of Sweden, with a large military presence and investigation, sent a letter pleading with Boris Yeltsin, the president of Russia, to please stop sending Russian spy subs into their borders. Except, some of the sounds that could only be an enemy submarine 
could also be a swimming mink. Sounds just like a propeller, small air bubbles, and when it swims from one island to the other, the mink sounds just like a boat. And this helped relieve some tension, but it wasn't quite enough. So 15 years after these mysterious sounds started, scientists and researchers did what they do. They start to question what else could possibly make these bubbled sounds that were considered evidence and proof that Russians were for sure spying on them. They had to find something that made bubbles. The staple food of Sweden, the herring, makes a lot of bubbles. The herring also has a swim bladder that is connected to the anal duct, which is very uncommon. So uncommon, in fact, among fish that the herring are the only fish to have their swim bladder. The necessary organ to help fish stay buoyant in water connects to their anal duct. So if a herring were to squeeze their air bladder or if they get scared, they make bubbles out of their anus. You know, an independent gas source. Farts. The scientists took some herring from the store, recorded them squeezing these dead fish underwater, creating farts, and then sent those sounds to the military, who confirmed that these sounds matched the sounds that they thought were a nuclear boat from a foreign country. Sorry, Russia. This led to my favorite slide in any TED Talk ever. The slide was titled, Submarine or Herring Farts? So Whiskey on the Rocks was about 1981. That was the year that I was born. And until 1996, the year I entered high school, Sweden was on high alert for military action and was bracing for military attack on their country. After Magnus Wahlberg squeezed the fish underwater and sent it to the military, there have been zero accounts of hostile activities of any kind in Swedish waters. This was the first time an audio clip was just not a figurative red herring, but a literal red herring. This led to the only time that a fart improved diplomatic relationships between two countries. I love podcasts. I mean, that's why I'm here, right? I like to create them, but I also love to listen to them. And there's one that I'm a big fan of, and it's called No Such Thing as a Fish. It is a weekly podcast where four hosts sit around the table and just go over their favorite headlines of the week. It is hilarious. It is funny. It is trivia. And it is so not appropriate for most young kids. But the facts that come out of the show are always so fun. And there was one on the podcast this week that really piqued my interest. The fact was octopus arms when detached from an octopus body like, cut off the arm completely. The arm will still continue to respond to pain, respond to stimuli like a pull, pain, and discomfort. And even when encountering a piece of food, a severed octopus arm will pick up the food and try to move it to where the octopus mouth should be. Y'all, their arms work for at least an hour after being severed from a body. Scientists have discovered the arms will continue to respond to pain, is aware of the environment, and will respond to danger. This is very different from the mechanisms we talked about before when the rattlesnake had bit that guy hours after beheading. That was a singular response that was hardwired into the muscles and body of the snake and the jaws. It is not an open and closing motion. He's not chomping after the guy. It was a quick snap, like a door that shuts once and doesn't open itself. The octopus arm, however, will continue to pick up food and try to feed an octopus body that isn't there, coil in as if something were painful, and open back up when it's safe. For us, our nosoceptors, special neurons that respond to physical danger, are controlled by our spinal cord. So if your hand were to touch a hot stove, ow, ow, ow! information would go from your hand to your spinal cord, and those nosoceptors would then tell the brain to pull back. And before you could even process that you were in pain, your hand would just be automatically pulled back. However, octopuses have these nosoceptors all over their body, so they don't necessarily need their brain to do any of the work. They can just handle their business at the source. If our arms were to be severed, you might actually have phantom pains or sensations as if you still had an attached arm. That has been studied, and it's been studied a lot. 
But if your arm was 30 feet away from your body, your arm would not respond to a hot stove if somebody were to touch it to a hot oven. Your arm would not feel pain as it doesn't have a connection anymore to the nociceptors in your spinal cord going to your brain. One video from Live Science showed an octopus getting his own severed limb. The arm went in with the octopus. The octopus held onto it. Nothing out of the ordinary, right? However, when a severed limb, and this gets really freaky, from another octopus was put in the tank, the octopus tried to grab at the arm and pull it towards himself, and the arm fought back. The severed arm sucked onto the glass. It appeared to pull backwards away from the pull of the octopus, who seemed to be pulling with quite a bit of force to no avail. This video is marked in the notes and will be up on all of my social media. This is the most bonkerballs thing that I have seen in ever. This gives a whole new meaning to the phrase and the famous Beck lyric, don't let your left hand baby know what your right hand do. These arms and the nociceptors might actually be part of how these super smart intelligent creatures are able to keep all eight arms intact. By having independent thought in each limb, the octopus's main brain can do other things like change color, problem solve, stay alive. Octopuses also send their limbs out of sight around corners into caves, into crevasses, and more, which in the ocean is a sure-fired way to get injured or worse. I have seen Jaws, y'all. The ocean can be terrifying. Super cool. Yes, that's why we're here, but I'm also aware that parts of the ocean will totally try to kill you. If an octopus were to lose an arm, unlike Hank the septopus from Finding Dory, they can regrow it back. Unlike a starfish where a leg can grow a whole new starfish, the octopus arm will eventually die off. But the octopus will absolutely regenerate a whole new limb. And not one of those dinky little lizard tail limbs that are sort of a tail if you look at it right. No, when an octopus grows back its arm, it grows it back hardcore. It is fully functional. It is a sensory leg that is just as good as the one that was there before the accident. But for now, we know that octopus are so amazing that even the European Union is interjecting some important regulations on studying these creatures. According to Gizmodo, quote, No matter what the reason for the strange movement or severed octopus arms, one thing is certain. This kind of scientific experiment will not happen again anytime soon. Because there is so much evidence for octopus intelligence, the European Union has issued a directive stating that no experiments may be done on octopuses and possibly other cephalopods like squid that cause them unnecessary pain or distress. Yay! And we haven't even started to talk about color changing, their venomousness, their ability to open jars or break out of octopus jail, or the lengths that octopus moms will go through to stay with their octopus babies until they hatch. Years. They sit still with their babies at the bottom of the ocean for years, slowly starving to death so their babies can live and be protected. Octopuses are octamazing, and I have a feeling that we have not talked about them for the last time. All right, so next Tuesday is Groundhog Day, so I thought I would investigate why it is that we celebrate this weird little holiday where a rodent tells us both the weather and the future. According to the Storm Facts Almanac, which has been tracking a famous groundhog named Puxatani Phil, and his predictions since 1887. That is 134 years. Phil has only been correct 39% of the time, which is right in line from what the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration found tracking this info for just 10 years, from 2008 to 2018. He was only right 40% of the time. This is a far cry from the accuracy rate that the groundlings inner circle say while pushing up a monocle and adjusting a top hat that Phil is 100% accurate. The data is wrong. How dare you, sir? At least that's how I imagine it. But that doesn't mean that this isn't a fun holiday. I mean, unless you're the groundhog. 
you just probably want to go back to bed as we all do for the first week of February. It's cold. It's dark. I want to go to bed too. And that was the case for Essex Ed, a New Jersey groundhog who just wouldn't wake up for his special day in the sun. Because of the unusually warm December, Ed's sleep schedule was a little bit wonky. Been there. As a result, Ed couldn't wake up, but that's okay, the show must go on. So they called in a ringer, a backup, an understudy, a hedgehog. Since Otis the Hedgehog was awake and ready to go for his big moment, they used him to not only predict the weather, his assertion was that there were six weeks of winter left, and that was inaccurate. Shocker. But also, they had him predict the winner of the Super Bowl that year, and while he was pulling for the Carolina Panthers, he was wrong there too. The Denver Broncos went on to win that game, leaving Otis at a disappointing 0-2 record as a hedgehog stand-in. And while people generally love Groundhog Day, if you are a mayor of a town or a city, you have a higher percentage of being bitten by an upset, tired, cranky, wild animal participating in this tradition than the percentage of a ground rodent being correct on predicting the weather. In recent history, one mayor had his ear bitten in Wisconsin after he held the town groundhog up to his ear, pretending to speak groundhog ease. You don't have to be a wild animal expert to understand that a bite is groundhog ease for put me down, I hate this. Mayor Bloomberg of New York tried to pull corn away from his groundhog co-host and ended up donning bandages on his left hand for the rest of the day as the groundhog called for a 100% chance of biting the mayor for taking my corn. So why do we do this? Well, this all comes from an old Pennsylvania Dutch superstition. If a groundhog comes out and sees his shadow due to sunny weather, he will go back into his den and sleep for six weeks. However, if it's cloudy, he doesn't see his shadow, spring will arrive early. It appears to stem from Germans marking Candlemas, Badger Day, as February 2nd. And before that, and in other parts of Europe, the meteorological animal predicting when spring arrives have been bears, foxes and badgers. In fact, the animal was altered as hibernating bears in Germany became more scarce and humans started looking for other hibernating creatures to predict the future. Though, I bet we would not be so eager to pull them out of their dens and take their corn if we were trying to do this with a bear or a badger. <coughs> Groundhogs go by several names. They are woodchucks. Yep, groundhogs and woodchucks, same critter. The woodchuck isn't because they actually chuck wood despite the tongue twister. Woodchuck, according to Scientific American, comes from the Algonquin term, woochuck. But that's not as good as the old Latin word for this caddyshack creature. It's Arctimus monax, or bear rats. They are also called whistle pigs and land beavers. And these land beavers might be in the opposite place that you would even think of. If you want to see a groundhog, you should look up, as they do live below ground, but they also spend quite a bit of time in the trees that they climb. And after reading this, the only thing I can think about is why we got rid of the term bear rat. This year, the famous Puxatawney Phil celebration will be altered. Traditionally, people start lining up at 6 a.m. to get a good spot to see the famous bear rat, but due to COVID concerns and restrictions, several things will be unique to the celebration. Number one, Phil, the animal, will also be wearing a mask. I'm here for masking up, but maybe not on wild animals. Two, the ceremony will be behind closed doors, where there is no sun, no clouds. Good luck? Three, if you want to watch, you can live stream it or make simple bets. Here are my predictions. I bet at least one mare will be bitten. I bet the groundhog has less than a coin flip chance of getting it right. And I bet that the groundhog would much rather be in bed like the rest of us and let the meteorologist handle this weather prediction. And I bet we can make bear rat a thing. So thanks for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you like this podcast, please share and tell all of your friends. It truly is the best way to support the show. 
If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or wacky animals in the news, please send them in. There are multiple ways to send them in or let me know what you think of the show. Visit the website, bewilderbeastpod.com. There you can find episodes to start with, share episodes, learn about the show, how to support the show, and see bonus art for some of the podcast episodes. It's also a great way for teachers to start to explore the show if they want me to come in and talk to their students. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at bewilderedpod, or you can DM or voice text at bewilderbeastpod on Facebook. I want to make sure that this is an accessible medium for everyone, so feel free to voice text instead if it's easier for you or if your littles want to share facts and can't write yet. The voice text feature allows a person to leave a one-minute voice message on their favorite animal, fact, or resource on the show. Or you can just lurk at the Wilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of Mud Stuff Media and this podcast. So go get curious. I got today's information from Wine and Cry. This is Definitely not for children, but the wine and crime gals did tip me off to the fish fart story, so thanks ladies. IFL Science, YouTube.com, Audioboom.com for facts relating to the severed octopus arm, Smithsonian Mag, on severed octopus arms having a mind of their own, Ocean Conservatory, blog.scientificamerican.com, sciencealert.com, gizmodo.com, Wikipedia for Groundhog Day, Best Life Online for hilarious Groundhog Day facts, ReadersDigest.com, and data on the accuracy of Puxitani Phil was discovered at EarthSky.org. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things the other podcasts tell you to do. Thanks for listening, and I will see you next week.